Welcome to Equine Assisted World. I'm your host, Rupert Isaacson, New York Times best-selling author of The Horse Boy, founder of New Trails Learning Systems and LongRideHome.com. You can find details of all our programs and shows on RupertIsaacson.com. Here on Equine Assisted World, we look at the cutting edge and the best practices currently being developed and established in the equine assisted field. This can be psychological, this can be neuro psych, this can be physical, this can be all of the conditions that human beings have that these lovely equines, these beautiful horses that we work with help us with. Thank you for being part of the adventure and we hope you enjoy today's show. Welcome back to Equine Assisted World where we look at people who are at the cutting edge of this rapidly expanding field. Um, today I've got someone exciting. We know we always have someone exciting. So this person's no less exciting. She's actually extremely exciting. Her name is Nina Eckholm Fry. Some of you will already know her from the work she's done at the University of Colorado, rather pioneering work she can let her tell, tell us about. Um, some of you may also know her from the organization HETI. And if you don't know what HETI is, you will after this podcast. And, but she has a much more interesting background than just equine assisted work and the study of it and human and animal communica uh, com communication, connectivity, relationship. Um, so without further ado, welcome on Nina. And uh, who are you exactly? Hi there. Super great to be here. Uh, who am I? I'm Swedish speaking Finn who's known you Rupert for quite some time. Indeed. Um, that's, that's where I want to start. But as you said, some folks may be familiar, maybe not. I work at, at University of Denver here in Colorado in the U.S. of A. But again, I'm from Europe originally. And at University of Denver, we have an Institute for Human-Animal Connection, where we do research as well as professional development when it comes to people's interests in, in interactions with all kinds of animals. But I work a lot with horses and that's also of course how me and, and Rupert and everyone over at Horse Boy 2 how we got to know each other so I think I'll I'll, I'll kind of start there with my, with my well let's let's just rewind a little bit uh, of course yes I, you and I are old mates um however most people listening are not familiar with that crucial piece of background that you gave a Swedish speaking Finn tell us about that tell us about that culture and how that culture has maybe informed your career path. I mean, it, it's, it's something very specific within Europe. Yeah, so yeah, Swedish-speaking Finns or Finland's svenskar, if we're using a Swedish-speaking Finn word, mean it simply means that in Finland we have two official languages and there's a minority, a language and ethnic minority who lives in Finland who speak Swedish as their first language and also have sort of a specific cultural identity as part of Finland. And it's it's a very good question you ask about how it's influenced me or kind of impacted me. Because when you grow up, obviously I'm a, or I shouldn't say obviously, but I am a white person. I'm a white woman from Northern Europe and the Swedish speaking Finns are predominantly white, but they're still a minority within Finland, a white minority. And so growing up in a minority status. Yeah. But I grew up in a what's called a majority minority area, simply meaning that in my village and in my county, we were predominantly Finland Svenskar or Swedish speaking Finns. So my immediate experience and my village was about you know, 200 people or so. My immediate experience was really connected to my ethnic and language identity. But the but the larger sort of area of come from the west coast of Finland, um, it, it was a it was a particular experience to start noticing things like identities and power and and differences like that. Uh, even early on, even before venturing out into Europe, before venturing out into the rest of the world and other continents, and then eventually ending up here in the U.S. So um, this 
minority experience. I know from your previous to being an academic life led you into some interesting human rights work. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, I I think in some ways it is a human rights work to become a mental health practitioner, to become a psychologist, to become interested in in the human mind. Um, and so I wouldn't say, other than my my overall experience of understanding power and privilege in a much deeper way than I did initially when I grew up. I didn't have parents or context where people were quite aware of equity and inequity, but I started seeing it and I saw it actually very early on in my village when a Finnish Roma family wanted to visit one of the stables, but they weren't really welcome. But because of my status in the village and because of my whiteness and because of my knowing this very small village, I was able to escort them. I was able to assume or use, wield, you know, my privilege to help them access, you know, what they were interested in visiting horses because horses are part of, of, of the Finnish Roma culture as well. So those were some early things, you know, around, around my interest in, 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 um, yeah, areas of privilege and power and equity, which after moving to the U.S. became quite a, quite a lived experience, you know, as an immigrant, as a, as a woman and very femme presenting woman living in a, in a whole new place in a more multicultural place than the fairly monocultural homogenous experience I had growing up, but being a minority population, but still. So I think some of my interest later on as well in thinking of just horses and humans and working now in a school of social work, th these things have really informed me in speaking more on or being more interested in things like power. So before you came over to the USA, you pursued obviously your early career there in Finland. What did you do between leaving school? Obviously you were a horsey girl. You're living in this very beautiful, very nature rich part of the world. But then what, what do you do? Where, where do you go for your working life? Do you go to the city? What happens? Yes. So I started actually at the very end of my degree, again, I was a psychologist working for the Red Cross. So I worked for called the Western District Red Cross. So not as a volunteer, but as a, but as a staff member and engaged mostly in crisis work within the country of Finland. So this wasn't international, international crisis work. We did, we did have two unfortunate school shootings, which is very, very unusual for Finland, but both happened during my tenure with the Red Cross. Um, one of them in our neighboring district, which meant that we went there, our, our staff went there. So I worked for the Red Cross for a while. They're overlapping kind of toward my graduation. I also worked for a couple of organizations for mental health, so related to mental health in general, but I also worked for an organization specific to folks who are autistic and folks with ADHD, which started kind of another connection point that we have here, uh, Rupert, but, but those were some of my early sort of mental health related work. Um, and then eventually I ended up back at my alma mater, the old university where I had graduated from. So. It was there that I was working still pretty early career in my 20s when all of a sudden there was a, um, a note or I can't, did I get an email about this? Some, somehow somebody said, hey, they're looking for a faculty member, uh, an associate professor position in America in, at Prescott College in Arizona, you know, applying for that, even though I quite liked the, uh, the position I had at my old university. But that really started. That's when things really started rolling, let's say. So you, you applied for this job sort of out of the blue, partly from a sense of adventure, I, I presume. Um, you get the job. That seems by itself somewhat of a tall order. There must have been, you know, loads of people applying for that job. Yeah, you get it. Um, and you come to America fresh off the boat. 
<laughs> Land in the desert. Uh, what do you come there to do at the University of Prescott? Yeah, so and the the position itself, the reason why I sought it was again not because I was unhappy where I was necessarily, but because at the time, this is sadly not the case any longer, but at the time Prescott College was well, it was I mean, I guess it's still known as this, but it was known as having some early at least experiential learning things with horses, kind of right. an innovative in institution that was born out of some sort of Harvard Business School experiment about the school of the future. And and they were, again, founded in the 60s, so not a very old institution. But the reason why I applied for that job was because they were asking for somebody to come and develop concentration for the Masters of Counseling students in, in the inclusion of horses in mental health. So, uh, so that the the counseling students who are getting their masters and to become licensed mental health counselors would then be able to study or add this concentration. They already had art therapy and eco stuff, somatic work, and they wanted to sort of formalize this. So that's really what I what I applied for. That's that's what took me away, so to speak, from from where I was working at the time. And I had I had traveled and I had lived in a couple of different places also earlier on but but that's what i came to do to 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 formalize some of the activities in the past few years there at prescott college yeah okay and then you arrive um not knowing much about the usa except as looking at it from the outside and you dive right into the college system there and and also prescott is an interesting town because it's there in the Arizona desert. It's those of you who who know it. It's north of it's of Phoenix between Phoenix and Flagstaff. It's sort of as you begin to go up towards the higher country, and it seems to be sort of equal parts liberal college town, a little bit like say Boulder or somewhere, and equal parts redneck Arizona. Um, and that must have been quite a cultural jump. How did you find it? Certainly was. And I had spent time in the U.S. prior, but only as a visitor. You yeah. know? So you can only get so much of a sense of a place. I mean, I had been to the Southwest, you know, the, a similar landscape. But something about the desert, which is the opposite, you could say opposite climate of Finland in so many ways. Finland's, you know, north and humid and we're talking desert here. It burned into my soul, the desert landscape, into my mind and soul mm-hmm. uh, in a very profound way. I just, because I, my, my feeling was very much, I have left this position that I had in Finland, which wasn't, you know, I did do pros and cons lists, but it wasn't, you know, the most terrifying thing necessarily I'd done. It was like, okay, well, if you... Are hiring me for this job, then I surely will come, kind of thing. Mm. But but when I so when I arrived, I knew I sort of had told myself, look, you're gonna like this uh, place. And I had I had visited one time after being accepted or <laughs> accepted after being employed, offered a contract, and while I was waiting for immigrant status to be resolved, so I had visited before once before I actually moved there physically. Okay. Was suitcases showed up there but and i knew i told myself look you're gonna like it you know because this is where this kind of cool job is and and uh, you know why why wouldn't you like it and i Mm. just arrived into this small town yes it's north of phoenix it's pretty small community it's pretty eclectic Mm. it's specific it has a very almost insular culture to it due to Mm. the way that the mountains rise uh, because it's a mile high city so you kind of drive up from phoenix you rise about three thousand feet and you end up in this little it's not a mountain town but it's high desert yeah and and it feels very place-based it feels very contained it was not it was completely different of course than my village and the city i grew up near but it was also not an urban metropolis. Right. It, was, it had very strong land connection. That's how I felt when I arrived, and I felt at home. And then, 
what did you 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 then began to move towards the work that you're doing now while you were there at Prescott um you began to organize very interesting events and congresses there can you just tell us about the work that you did there and then that'll be, give us a way to jump into the work you're doing now at Denver yes yes so again I arrived with the task to sort of solidify what had happened there and I of course also arrived with a quest to know what is happening here in the states I mean at that time yes there were emails and slow internet browsers but it wasn't like now where yeah. you could just get people on the on the phone you know or or chat or message with people i had some contacts but my main quest was literally to see what is going on here when we were talking about horses and we're talking about therapy and especially psychotherapy so my my early years i was there for 5 years were really really focused on networking were really focused on bringing people together as you mentioned i organized some large large events and of course running the the concentration within the master's program there for students bringing in speakers and and you know i've had you there too for some of our both our undergrad and our graduate students so i spent several years basically trying to get to know as many people as possible and as much about the context of the United States and equine interactions in therapy, since I had some of that coming from, from Europe. But here, we had a completely new landscape. And I could also add, I also spent some earnest time trying to understand what these, you know, natural horsemanship dudes in the West were talking about. I had some experience, you know, of course, being classically trained, classical equitation in Europe. But I, I gave it a really good shot when they were running horses around in the round pens and they were doing stuff like that. And I earnestly was like, I'm going to I'm going to try to understand what you all are talking about, but really found that that a lot of it wasn't science aligned or it wasn't for me. So I did spend a lot of time in the sort of on the horse side only as well. And what had you been involved in the equine assisted work um, in Finland before you? came yes. uh, to the US. Okay. Tell yes. us about that and, and, and both, yeah, your background there. Yeah, both practically as in providing services and including horses, but also toward the end of my time there, begin again, I was then by then into my mid twenties, yeah. I had started to become nationally involved. So I was a vice president of one of the national organizations there and we were working on sort of a couple of initiatives, meaning that I'd started to do some of the work that I am doing quite a bit now too, which is not only, you know, boots on the ground kind of experiences or practical experiences, but also trying to uh, positively influence things like guidelines or or larger systems where possible. So the the work you did when you were providing services in Finland, was that sort of classic therapeutic riding or adaptive riding was that more the equine assisted psychotherapy direction what how are you doing it what was the what was the menu you were offering there yeah not really adaptive riding i actually became an adaptive riding instructor after i came to the us which i you know made sure i kind of got to understand what they're doing there i was familiar with that area it's called something else in in finland but no the inclusion of horses in human services. So both, you know, psychotherapy services and also what we'd call more supportive services was what I was doing there. So with autistic kids, so families with autistic family members, more so what we call supportive services. It's a little more like what um, I've also had the opportunity to work with you and new trails, uh, more that kind of thing, mm. but also and separate from that with the other clientele, you know, use of psychotherapy as the treatment and then the including of the horse right. into that process. So so it's a little bit of, 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 again, more learning or supportive service as well as healthcare service. Okay. And then you arrive, obviously, in this academic role in Prescott. Do you start 
also offering services there. And also you say you, you start getting to know as many people in the field as you can. What are the main differences that you found um, between the approaches, the equine assisted approaches in Europe to here? What struck you? Yeah, yeah. No, and, and, and this is a topic that, that you and I also know quite a bit about when you come to a new country as an immigrant, takes a while for you to get certain permissions to do certain kinds of work. So yes, when I first arrived, I, I didn't have the status to allow me to do multiple, to, you know, work for multiple employers, basically, or to even have my own business yet. Right. That took several, several years before I was able to. And when I was able to, I was then able to provide psychotherapy, primarily in the resident treatment settings where clients would come for typically longer term treatment, primarily co-occurring trauma and addiction or co-occurring trauma and, and substance use. And I worked for uh, a few um, agencies in, in that kind of staff therapist role there, also in, in Arizona, but much later on than those initial years due, right. to, due to immigration restrictions. But the, yes, the differences were in terms of you're asking the differences between, you know, how the inclusion of horses would look in Europe at that time, which has also changed, you know, a, a bunch compared to the States. I mean, I knew or I was aware already while living in Europe that there were a lot of these so-called models and brands. So very American, you know, ideas of, of like, oh, I'm going to brand this and call this something very specific. So I was aware that that was what was happening there. And a lot of actually folks in Europe were looking more to the U.S. specifically around psychotherapy. You know, the use of equine movement in physical therapy and occupational therapy, speech therapy, really originated in the German-speaking parts of, mm. of, of Europe. And that felt very solid <laughs> as a... And also, you know, Finland was an early, early also forerunner with the first training in 1989, mostly focused on, again, physical therapists and what's called ergotherapists or occupational mm. therapists. But the psychotherapy work, surely there was, there, or there was definitely some early stuff happening in the 80s and 90s in, in the German-speaking countries with the inclusion of horses in psychiatry, the inclusion of horses in psychotherapy. But there was definitely the sense that the Americans are doing a lot in this, like the Americans are really pushing forward. So that was, of course, something I was particularly interested in. And it was very much more, when I was working in, in Northern Europe, very much more common that a person was a physical therapist, for instance, yeah. instead of psychotherapists around who included horses or or even dogs and other animals in their in in their work. So coming to the states, it also was a matter of of just very I took a very empirical approach to to starting to see okay what what are you all doing here and what can I get trained in? And I got trained in basically most things that were available at that time and really committed to understanding what the thing was and then you know sometimes arriving to this is not for me or this, you know, after getting familiar with a number of things that were was going on, you know, in the U.S. and really dedicating myself to understanding it first, I did notice that there was quite a, quite a few things that w weren't for me or didn't seem aligned with healthcare, specifically healthcare in the way we might talk about, you know, in health insurance, billable service or using a term like psychotherapy to talk about treatment. Um, yeah, so I, I made sure I got real familiar at, at first and also kept my relationships. Um, you know, there's a few people who are doing, who, who are running programs and, and yeah. we all have similar interests. We're all, you know, colleagues, some really close friends too, for sure. Yes. What, what, what of the methods that you got trained in did you find really spoke to you? You know, I hate to be so biased here, but I ran into somebody named Rupert and he was talking about some horse boy stuff. And I said, Oh, I I've met him. My... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But honestly, I, that was learning about 
So both, of course, the inclusion of horses in the horse boy, you know, new trail system here, but really the the fundamentally right approach or appropriate approach to autism as a neurotype was honestly what really really got me because we weren't talking about horses stuff instead this my experience this was we're centering an autistic experience we're centering understanding each other as humans here and right. now we're thinking how do we include horses into that and that was very attractive you know to me and that was the way that i was thinking about things already mm. and 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 so some of my again in my early empirical investigations spent a lot of time also going back and forth to Texas and and learning at that time and 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 learning more and that's really what 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 got me what I thought this this makes sense to me. You're you're extremely kind, um, and obviously with Horse Boy we 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 try our best um, to keep it an ever ever developing organism. We still obviously as you know go for regular uh continuing education really mentorship from neuroscientists and, and indeed from autists autists themselves um apart from horseboy method did you find some other methods here in the u.s that really spoke to you and said yes particularly on the psychotherapy end was that were there some things that really stood out yeah i think with honestly the other trainings which i either then i took and became credentialed or i even hosted workshops mm. it didn't seem like they were using the same conceptual frame that was still sort of an in infancy in my mind that i've later you know sort of really helped bring forth in my own work and, and in right. kind of national national contexts when the time was right for more clarifications around terminology and concepts and things like that just a few years ago here. But I didn't find that the really a, a kind of singular other approach that sort of was so clearly anchored in the understanding of, in this case, a particular population, not to say that this, this your work is inherently tied just to one kind of person or something like that, um, because it has so many aspects to it that are useful for developing minds and people and that kind of thing so it wasn't i i think it was more like oh this approach is an, another approach that take parts from that or this other approach was really leaning into like working with teams and business executives things like that and and i was like oh yeah i've done a lot of this experiential learning stuff in the forest of finland here i can recognize some of these, you know, the, the same learning ideas, of course, the same experiential learning theory. And that makes sense too. But they felt more like these are very specific, specifically directed things. And they weren't necessarily separating the equine interaction from right. what's provided. And I think for me, that was always really important to, or how I, again, a little later started really more clearly conceptualizing this in my own work so now let's go to to the work you're doing now you you you've come out of the university of prescott you spent five years there you've gotten to know the equine assisted scene you've you as you say you've you've explored horse boy you've explored some other methodologies you've taken ideas from a number of places your background though still remains you know within the psychotherapy end but yet then you end up at denver university and you end up at a really, I would say, it still is, and it certainly was then, but it's it's remained, I think, the really cutting edge program, I think, within the USA on exploring what's the value of human-animal um, connection. So how did you end up at Denver? What was on your mind to go there to do? And tell us about the work you've developed since you got there. Yes. Yeah, so I, I did not necessarily have a, a, a clear plan of leaving this this very compelling desert community in Arizona. I quite, you know, by then I'd gotten myself some, a better immigration status. I had my horses who 
who are, you know, some of which are, who are still alive and they live now here in one state over in Colorado. No, it was, um, it's actually a, um, a colleague of mine who so graciously said, hey, I'd like you to come work at University of Denver. I'd like you to come to the Institute for Human-Animal Connection. I'd like you to lead our equine efforts because the Institute had been in existent, existence for years, but it's sort of just been one faculty member and then initially a part-time staff position. It'd been kind of small. And right around that time, 2014, 2015, um, there was a concerted effort to actually build the Institute. And there was a se several of us, including the then director of research, who's now the current executive director of the Institute, and myself and, again, some other folks started at the same time. It was a very exciting time because it was possible to not only build on existing work that had been going on at the smaller scale at the Institute, but now really take both the research side as well as the professional development or the sort of education side of that Institute forward. So I got also had the opportunity to shape my role a little bit and wanted to make sure that it included both therapeutic human-animal interactions as well as the experiences of horses in communities, meaning things like equine behavior, equine welfare, but really anchored in more of a social science lens as opposed to a veterinary medicine lens or, or, or things like that. So when people think about, you know, a university beginning to put its attention on this kind of thing, um, which I think for a lot of people is still a surprise. I think, I think a lot of people, even in our field, are still perhaps unaware that you have your institute at Denver University and now there's other academic institutions beginning to follow suit. I think a lot of us have spent so long sort of out in the wilderness that we we, it, it, it comes as a bit of a shock to us to think, oh, universities are actually interested in what we do. Um, but there you are, of course, beginning to, to run these, well, well it's, it's for you to tell us what you were doing. We, we always picture, we laymen, we non-academics, what do they do at universities? They either teach or they run research, right? Um, what I presume you, be, would, the Institute began doing both. Um, tell us about the research end. Tell us about the, t the vocational end. Yes, yes. So at the University of Denver, I'm a, a faculty member in the Graduate School of Social Work. This is also where the Institute sits, even though, again, I'm not a, a social worker by training. This is typically a U.S. profession. You know, when we talk yeah. about social work, this, this, this social work in Europe has different flavors, let's say, depending on the country, and it's a different kind of it's a different professional area than the core, what's known as the kind of U.S. social work profession. Um, I emphasize this again because, um, you know, our sec executive director is a molecular biologist by training. Tell us, again, who, who is your executive director? Uh, Dr. Kevin Morris is his name, uh, who, you've, who you've also met at times. Um, yeah, we've had, uh, he's, he's an, an intriguing, that. intriguing figure. And perhaps a little bit further on, you'll give us a bit of background on him because I think I think that would be useful for our, our listeners. But okay, so you, 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 uh, you're there, you're beginning to run studies, you're beginning to research the field? Yeah, so, so again, at the, at the Institute, we have a, a, a research side to it, so to speak, where we can process and manage grants and research processes. And we also do professional development and education and sort of like implementation science, basically, like like it's not just research because research tends to occur in quite narrow areas right. depending on its funding. Um, but so our institute, I feel, is very unique also in that we we bring research to practice or we, we spread the word about what's happening. So my roles currently on the, on the faculty side within the graduate school I lead an area of social work study, which is also very unique, called human-animal environment interactions in social work. And the fact that we've taught these courses about the importance and impact of human-animal interactions at University of Denver since 1996, there was one little course. And now, you know, it, it's really been 
DU or University of Denver has been a forerunner thanks to uh, people like Philip Tedeschi and others who really said, I want to teach about humans and animals with a social work lens. And now I'm in the position where I'm, again, overseeing this year specialization for people to formally study this in social work, but to understand the importance and impact of these relationships, also in clinical work, but also in a number of settings, like, you know, pet ownerships, companion animals, other health benefits of just being connected to nature. <laughs> um, really? That's been a really a gift. Um, for University of Denver to be also supporting other social work schools in in really daring to talk loudly about, you know, human-animal environment interactions. So that's part of my work. And then my other part is at the Institute, which I can talk more about too, but I wanted to sort of highlight the, the unique academic content um, that's also happening that more and more institutions are starting to dare have courses on human animal interactions and so if you're doing that at a social a school of social work does that mean that um these are student social workers and basically what they're being taught is the value of doing the work they're going to do professionally with say therapy dogs therapy horses or outside in nature to get a better outcome for their clients and to, encouraging them to go animal-based, nature-based in their own practices. Is, is, is that sort of the idea? Yes, part of it, because not every social work student, so they are social work students. I also teach in the Graduate School of Professional Psychology, so I teach some of the doctoral students about interventions that include animal interactions, and that's more squarely clinical. Yeah, The social work students, the majority of them honestly are clinically focused, and that's pretty typical. You know, we have a clinical license for social workers, et cetera. But social workers also work on policy levels. They also work in what we call meso areas, meaning they might not work directly with one to one service. They might prefer to work with systems instead. They might prefer to work with policies or promote um, the understanding. Yeah. Uh, Again, the impact and importance of these relationships. If you're seeking a safe place to be because of intimate partner violence, you're not going to go to that shelter if it means you have to leave your dog behind in your house or give them up for adoption, a family member. You can choose between being not beaten up every day or leave your dog there to be beaten up. That's not a choice that people you know, make. <laughs> and, but but others may not understand this. Mm. Others may say, well, of course you're going to dump the dog, right? Humans, humans first. But that's mm. not how the human species works necessarily with mm. the importance of our interspecies connections. And that's really how we live, you know, and have been living. Mm. So it's, it's understanding those kinds of things. Oh, why why are we seeing people who are killed by their intimate partners well, they might have barriers to seeking safety. Well, m one of them might be that we're not understanding the importance and impact of their animal relationships completely or fully. So those are that's one of a, a ton of examples that relate to, again, these, these human-animal environment interactions also outside of clinical work, but very much so also including animals in nature into the therapy process, like you said. And would you hope that some of these students that then go on to have careers in, as you say, in the systems, in the admin, end up working in local health authorities or, or even national health authorities? And then one would hope that what they've learned and what they've been taught and has a knock-on effect that as they become policy makers, they include animal-assisted stuff in government-funded or insurance company funded treatment. So looking into uh, Yes. And, yeah, and it's really also understanding, right? Like currently you you can include interactions with dogs and cats, horses, guinea pigs, rats in psychotherapy without restriction and getting reimbursed. Okay. You can't do you can't do things like animal therapy or dog therapy or horse therapy because that's not a therapy in the healthcare system, you know, you can psychotherapy and do that 
perfectly well and include interactions with animals to enhance that. And that's a billable service because the animal does not constitute treatment or a modality or a strategy or an intervention. And this is something that then, you know, these graduate students who are really advanced learners in this area, um, you know, gain knowledge about. And then, just like you said, some of them may be working clinically, but others may work in systems. And they may be setting policies for the schools, which happens quite a lot. The school okay. district promote more animal and nature access in public schools, for instance. Okay. Okay. So you're really paying it forward. I mean, you're, what you're doing there at DU is uh, really training up the next generation of policymakers to place value on nature and animals um, at the institutional slash school slash cl billable clinical level and that maybe yep. we might be looking at a better picture of that in 15 years because these people have now gone on to somewhat senior positions having yes. gone through your program that's great yeah and, and in many ways all all education and training we also have our postmasters training program which is not tied to an academic degree it's a postmasters training meaning you have a uh, master's or doctoral already, and you, you're, ta you're taught to, to include interactions with horses into psychotherapy. That's one of our professional development offerings. But I think that any, any of these trainings, right, that mm. we, anytime we educate, it is a pay it forward because it is sort of helping others gain the knowledge and apply it. But you're right that we, we do, we might really do have a very specific sort of intention as well around social good and social justice, where we really emphasize that people who are graduating, whether from master's or doctoral programs or from the professional development post-masters, that the idea is really that the wave lifts us all, like mm. go, go forth and, and, and teach others, go forth and, and learn, learn more together with others. This is not a question of competition or who who has the best you know training program. It's it's really about the recognition, like you said, or the importance of human animal interactions in a variety of ways. Are you looking? Are you seeing now other universities following suit from what DU has pioneered? Are, are you seeing similar types of programs springing up across the U.S. now? Yeah, I mean, I, I spend a fair bit of time chatting with, consulting with, you know, with colleagues in, in various, especially in social work, in various social work schools. But I also, you know, me and my actually former grad student, we just had another paper come out just last week, in fact, that maps the academic coursework that includes equine interactions in human services, meaning any courses that are at universities and colleges that teach either things like adaptive or therapeutic writing. That's the same thing. You know, that's more of a writing school course industry activity. Mm -hmm. um, but there's quite a lot of undergraduate institutions that have coursework specific that students can take, especially within equine, you know, science or equine studies. And it includes things like learning services. So education, that kind of thing where people teach a course how to include the horse. And of course, in therapy, whether that's psychotherapy, whether that's occupational or physical or speech therapy, and also which institutions have survey or overview courses. So we just, the, this study just came out, like I said, last week, mapping the, this. And we did a comparison because we did a replication of our study that came out five years ago. And we saw an increase um, in courses, an increase in institutions offering these coursework, institute, you know, increase in departments. So there's definitely not just in my own personal kind of perception, but also, you know, using data, an increase in interest in academic institutions when it comes to these things. This is the way of the future. Well, that's wonderful because, I mean, that can only mean that, yeah, professionals of the future are going to come out of these programs. And as you say, that's, that's got to be a tie that will lift all boats, a much needed one. Um, you, you are now also working outside of DU. I know that you've got 
you know, you, you, you are very influential and active um, in the sort of wider world of equine assisted stuff. You're sitting on boards, you're, you're helping to get the field sort of moving forward and evolving. Which, which boards and so on are you currently sitting on and which organizations are you, would you like us to know about that are doing work that you feel we should all be aware of? Yes. Yes. So currently I sit on the American Hippotherapy Association board. This is an organization that supports uh, licensed physical therapists, occupational therapists, and speech language pathologists in the use of equine movement as a therapy tool. And not the horse, but the equine movement in healthcare in the U.S. on in these professions is described as a therapy tool, the movement that the horse provides. So I sit on this board. This is actually my sixth and final year. Uh, I've, I've served on this board for quite a while, sometimes as the only mental health professional amongst my colleagues. Uh, and it's been a, a really rewarding experience. I also currently, I'm trying to think of larger, larger things. I sit on an advisory board for the state of Massachusetts that I'm really excited about because it's about promoting green care and it's about al allocating funds to providers in the state who are serving adolescents and young adults who have some sort of connection to substance use challenges, but it's finding ways of engaging people um, with green arenas or green spaces in, in, in their service provision, which is typically psychotherapy, but there's also other ways that these, this population can be served under these state monies that exist. So the advisory board role is to um, allocate the money and also to advise, you know, the, the um, recipients of the money, the grantees in that state. So those are a couple of, of larger things that happen to not be specifically about equine interaction, but I also, you know, work with other, other contexts or other, other things as well. Um, well, I think you made a very good point earlier, which is that the interaction with horses and animals in general is part of the general interaction with nature. Yes. One, one can't accept, you know, one tends, nature tends to get used to mean interactions with natural landscapes as something rather separate from animals. But I'm a great believer that it's all the same and yeah. to separate one from the other is asinine, um, but it's understandable why people do it. So I, it's exciting to me that you are making a point of drawing that connection on, on, on an academic and an organizational level. Um, what, what draws you to, what drew you to the hippotherapy association in particular? What was, what is it about that, that approach that speaks to you? Yeah, I would. And I also want to make sure I, I mention a couple of organizations that I think there's been some really exciting or interesting okay. stuff Please. happening with human horse interactions, but yeah, the American hippotherapy association or AHA, again, the word hippotherapy is a little tricky. You can just say equine movement. It means the same thing. But I was originally asked to join that board because of my work on the mental health side. Yeah. So this organization has been a longstanding organization, very typically organized, you know, for licensed providers. Um, so I, I have just enjoyed the exchange with my colleagues since I, at, at the time I was still serving as the, I think the, the chair of the credentialing board called the CBEIP or the Certification mm -hmm. Board for Equine Interaction Professionals, which credential um, mental health professionals voluntarily, you know, this is a voluntary national thing, mental health professionals as well as learning professionals. And I think it was through that connection as well, because there's a separate credentialing board, similar one for OTs and PTs, occupational and physical therapists. So I think it was, a, I was asked to join or, or, you know, to talk more what's happening on the mental health side. What's, what's going on there? Because mm -hmm. unfortunately there's not, there's not a singular organization similar to AHA that exists for those who provide psychotherapy and who are licensed or licensable, which is a very specific way of looking at, right. you know, therapy and treatment. Yeah. So that's how I, that's how I ended up there. And it's been, Six six short years in a major pandemic, and 
you know, it's been been a lovely, lovely time. And it's really also made me um, really connected to my colleagues who have different professions than me, but are still um, healthcare providers. So, yeah. Okay. But I want- yeah, so you yeah. mentioned that you wanted to draw our attention to a couple of other things. Oh, okay. Yes, yeah, since, you, since you mentioned this, you mentioned in the very beginning HETI, Horses in Education and Therapy International, and I would just a couple of years ago finished tenure as a journal editor for them that I was for 10 years. Um, and so they've been, a, a, and I'm you know still connected to them, they're sort of the international horse-specific <laughs> organization for, for, again, horses in therapy and education. Um, uh, a similar organization, but for sort of all human-animal interactions, is called IAHIO, uh, the International Association for Human-Animal Interaction Organizations. And IAHIO is, I've been connected with them for years too, but I wanted to highlight that there was a really good equine welfare and training and handling guidelines that came out of IAHIO and are freely available, you know, for people to to find. I had the pleasure to be part of it, the international work group that created those guidelines and a couple of other things related to horses. But I think if I look back at the last few years of, you know, doing this kind of especially international work, which is very difficult to do because we are now talking about different countries, different cultures, different ways of thinking that d- don't have to be the same, you know. But those applying guidelines, I'm really, really proud of them, how they turned out and, you know, the group that came together and their contribution overall when we think about horses in, you know, various human services, including, adapt, you know, and think about adaptive or therapeutic riding, these guidelines were meant to be applicable for all these various areas and i and i and i thought that that was such neat work um, so i wanted to highlight that as as you know another can you resource. be a bit more specific about those guidelines what so tell us about them in a bit more detail what do they yeah. say yeah so they their guidelines for there's sort of two areas called care and welfare and the other area is training and handling okay and what I really appreciated about Ayahayo's approach specifically is that there's quite a lot of these welfare guidelines or ethics guidelines. They can be quite aspirational. They can be quite thin. There might be a couple of sentences, you know, do no harm and, you know, let's be good to horses or something like that. But they don't necessarily provide more detailed guidance. It just depends on how a prompt is con- conceptualized. Sometimes we want more bigger principles, right? But this, the the organization um, supported the direction of our work group to take a braver stand, to be clearer and more detailed, which is again difficult internationally about that we, yeah, that we need to use science-based approaches of understanding horses. We need to think further than our own nose, as we say in Swedish, meaning, you know, sometimes if we stop thinking, we haven't gotten very far, barely off of our own face here and not even thinking about the welfare of horses and other species. So the the guidelines are quite um, they're detailed, they're clear in their recognition of horses as also vulnerable participants in these services and they give you know clear guidance look horses need to have fiber they need to be with other horses they can't just stand inside in extreme confinement all day and we just call that good yeah so those are some of the 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 spirit of the guideline really push things forward and i even have been asked to give a talk at a at a conference I, I gave this was it last year no still this year even about the development of the guidelines, because it was so unusual to be able to move. Maybe there are a couple of steps ahead, but I don't mind, you know, we'll catch up. Do you, have you found that those guidelines are being instituted and followed? Um, have you been able to trace that in certain areas? 
Yeah, I mean, not formally, because there's not a mechanism to say like, okay, this country does this, but mm -hmm. I've had colleagues translate them into different languages. And some have asked me to eye through them to see if they retain, you know, their original thought. Okay. But again, English is my third language. So just, we're all just trying here. Um, and I've definitely had people contact me to ask a clarifying question or, you know, like they're, they're not just sitting Somewhere. Okay. So people They're appear to be alive. reacting to them. Yeah. Because yeah, I, I, as you know, we, we work internationally with Horseboy and when I'm going into new countries, sometimes it's like, it's going to be tricky here. Yeah. The level of horse care is not what we'd want to see. Yeah. And then the question is always, but could it get there? Um, and you know, if you're, if you're one organization working alone, the answer is, well, maybe but it would be down to an individual stable deciding to up, up its game. Uh, but I, what I really like about what you're doing with IHIO is um, it encourages a bit more of a systematic and institutional change. And perhaps some of the equine assisted national bodies also beginning to look at this more and have that trickle down effect. Um, because it's true that, you know, when we're in the US or when we're in Europe, we often, to some degree, take for granted the good horse welfare. But even there, we can get some nasty surprises sometimes. Um, but yeah, when you go outside, it, it, it's anybody's guess. You know, it, it, it's that thing of particularly when one goes to countries where the horse is not necessarily part of the traditional culture. But it's something that may have been brought in. So with... With the work that you're doing academically, to bring it back to the university, yeah, do you, where are you hoping to take it? What's your, what's your ambition? What, do you, what, what are your plans? Yeah, I mean, I feel so fortunate that I'm, I'm where I want to be in terms of the space to do the work that's of interest to me, ability to just think, okay, what, what do I want to do? Do we want to do more big events? Is that really where we want to, you know, sit? Does another organization do that better or as well? And this is what we've found, for instance, in our collaboration with Green Chimneys in New York, and that we're, we're now, you know, collaborating on big practitioner conference events. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so for me, my, the trajectory right now in the leadership team at the Institute is really about where can we and I be most effective? We just launched a new equine behavior course, which is a completely online, you know, with videos and things like that to just see like where are people accessing information? How can I, you know, work, which is my internal drive, you know, for a more just world for people, for horses, for Again, people with different identities that might disadvantage it, them in the eyes of others, you know, yeah. like disabilities or being neurodivergent or being a woman or, you know, these things that are categorical instead of individual. Mm. Um, you know, I, I, I think then a lot, like I said, right now, because I have some, some ability to make things happen more and more without having to lift the whole thing myself, you know, which, which is not unusual in early, early career, of course, but, but to really think where can we and I be most effective? Where can we make the most impact with these messages again about, about justness and about it? And where is that? Where, where I, where do you feel you can make the most impact in the short, in the next short term? Yeah. So far, of course, is. A lot of people access things more easily online. Okay. So, you know, being able to offer offer access to our, you know, research, access to learning. But at the same time, interestingly enough, the post-master's program that I lead, we require three in-person trainings in a, or like it, it's a limited residency, 10-month training program. It's an advanced it's program. It's long. It's mm -hmm. not... And, you know, that perhaps sells faster, let's say, if mm. you're doing a shorter thing over a weekend. But here, instead of reducing the in-person training, we, we, are, we are staying with three, 
four day trainings across 10 months, which yeah. is quite a lot of in-person activity and might be again, more profitable, let's say to run it differently. But there I'm finding that the impact, the, the return on investment for the participants is so, so much higher when they are actually training hands-on in a very fine culture. So it's not a drop in, drop out, which also increases access. But I'm sort of modeling that, you know, I'm thinking both about how does this look when it is more online or accessible, but also how does it look when you're really doing a very specifically kind of specific culture of learning in advanced training. And we've really, you know, found great success with the Postmasters program uh, to the point where we're full, you know, we're full constantly. Wow. And uh, in terms of Alaha and not Alaha, sorry, Ayahayo, I was mixing it up with the Luthitano and that is yours, the show core. I was like, um, Ayahayo and, and Hetty, where, where are you hopeful that the work with these international equine assisted bodies is going? What would you like to see? Again, international work is so tricky. I was just supporting my colleagues at Hetty about this, about another international project um, that I'm that I'm not a part of, but I was lending lending my input uh, when, when invited to do so. And I think that the movements internationally, there's a balance between this idea that there's just one right way that mm. I you know I can work more intensively with that within a specific culture or in this case within a specific healthcare system. I know how the US healthcare system works and I know how this how how, how to best go forward with that. So there in those contexts, I'm very much, you know, able to be very specific, which an international organization might not be, not with those kinds of details. But what I'd like to see internationally when where you can't really advise people within their own healthcare systems you have to know how that how it works and it, and how what words are being used and how to understand the animal interaction there but internationally i think we are we're moving ahead with more just what you and i talked about more attention to what's acceptable welfare mm. like what is acceptable here because it becomes a social license to operate more so than actual governmental licenses and things like that in most cases, especially in the U.S., where it's more about, hey, this is how we're doing this thing. Do you want to be part of this? This is how we're modeling. This is how we appear. This is how, you know, as a group, as an area, what we accept and we don't accept. And I feel like we're getting closer to things like not accepting 24-hour confinement, mm. extreme confinement specifically. And then, you know, one hour you get to do or a therapy session with, if you're a horse, you know, you get to come out of this stall mm. <laughs> and do this one thing and then you get to go back in. I think it's, it's the idea isn't to create barriers for access. The idea is to remove the the, the physical structure in a lot of cases, but to rethink the design and what's allowable um, for horses and, and what we accept for horses, because it doesn't necessarily mean we have to have bigger places outside of the city and only some access them. Sometimes it means we just have to redesign and rethink what we already have here. Uh, yeah, I I agree. It's very interesting. The the project in Dublin, Central Dublin, uh, Child Vision, which, as you may know, is a school for the visually impaired, but it's yes. right in the middle of the city. And when it started, it has an equine program, and we've been involved there for some yes. years. And when we first became involved there, they had quite a lot of land, and then it all got sold. And they're down to the stable yard, an arena one very, very small turnout paddock and a rugby field that they have to share with the local school which, around which they have a sensory trail and then the, you know, a bit of another trail. And the people who are running the equine program there, um, Terry Brosnan, who was a guest on, on, on this podcast, and uh, Lucy Dillon, who I hope to get on, they've been incredibly inventive about how to make sure 
that the horses get their outside time, get their crazy time being free jumped as in groups in the arena, in herds, that they get to go out and be hand walked and hand grazed um, and that they built this in as part of the therapy so that they're not having a conflict of time between, well, I've got to see all the, serve all these clients, but how am I going to get time to train or, or serve the horses? But it's, it's built into the client time. And um, then of course they're rotated out of the city every week or two as well. So they're just allowed to go into a field and just live out. Um, they've been very proactive about this, but as you, yeah, as you know, it's, it's, it's not always the case. Well, what are you, what are you the most excited about in terms of, cause you get to look at a lot of different programs. What are you excited about in the sort of general way the equine assisted world is going? And are there some programs out there that you feel that we should be aware of that are more recent that we feel you feel we should be taking a look at? Yeah. And I can mention having worked with Child Wish Vision a bit too and and knowing Terry Rossman really well. Yeah. Um, so I'm aware of what you all are doing, of course, there that it's I, I just want to highlight them also as an example of very restricted, like you said, like space. Yeah. And serving folks in a very central location and really, really feeling out that balance of, you know, is this, is this sufficient? Can we do it this way? Should we do it this with what we have given the, the changes that they experience? But the, I think the, the key thing that some folks lack is the right attitude. And Child Vision has that right attitude, meaning yeah. they are willing to examine every part of their equine living environment and their processes and then try to see, okay, we're going to do this to the max here with what we have and then, you know, assess that in a really sort of honest way. And that, I think, when I think about sort of programs and people and things like that, I think mostly about when I encounter that quality and and I, I consult for a foundation here in Southern Colorado called Flying Horse Foundation. And they're very similar like that. You know, the attitude is there, uh, meaning we can solve the other stuff in various ways, but we can't solve an attitude that's not willing to be willing to examine really the truth about our relationships with horses, which is we do. You know, we do what we want and we kind of want them to be okay too, but we can all, we can't sort of delude ourselves about the power difference between us. So that's, I guess, what I would be most excited about also internationally, given that people think about equine interactions in so many ways, it would be to continue cultivating a, the, an attitude, an attitude that I actually also have seen saw quite a bit in my early work with you all in Texas, right? This attitude of like, if the attitude's right, mm. we can solve this other stuff. Yeah. But can't without a creative mind, we can't without some resources. But the point isn't to have unlimited resources. Yeah. <laughs> the point is to, to be able to really work with what you have. And that's what I do when I do facility design consultation for, I get to do this with you know, also equestrian facilities outside of human horse interactions. That's what gets me excited. That's what I want to help cultivate in people. And I try to model it, of course, in myself, but I'm, that's maybe where I want to, mm. has to go as an area, you know. So how can listeners learn more, get involved? Um, and also how can they help, how can they become part of that mission, for example, with Etty and I, Ohio, and um, if someone is, if it's a lot of the people who are going to be tuning into this, they won't necessarily be, you know, veterans of the field. A lot of people, a lot of them are young people who are looking to go into this as a profession. Um, and there's a kind of, as you know, now there's this kind of almost too big of a smorgasbord of available ways to go in now where it was very narrow a few years ago. Um, so yeah, a, how, how do people reach you and what involvement 
and participation can they have in what you're doing and what these organizations are doing? And then um, from that, I'm going to ask you for some advice for some people coming into the industry. So, so mm -hmm. to start with, how do people contact you, get involved in, and what kind of involvement would be useful to the university and, and to these organizations to kind of bring this whole field forward? Do you feel? Yes. Yeah, the main the main important involvement is the person with themselves, like like finding what you're interested in and then modeling, living through your values, which can be hard if you don't have a tribe or a co or a context or community. Mm -hmm. They will they are they are there out there. You just have to try to find which one is right for you. But the most important a valuable way of starting to get involved is of course to seek out knowledge but then start living living through it um yourself you know so you're not just sort of passive passively thinking about stuff but getting in there and finding opportunity where you can try different things out but when it comes to the university you know we of course mostly work internally with our students you know oh. we have formal formal processes because we're a university that relates to them even if you are, you know, students at the University of Denver, they can be work studies, they can be part of our research as student researchers, things like that. So we we do a lot of that training, but it's internal to the university. Seeking out some of our, we, we have professional development courses and things like that, but we also do like, you know, stream presentations and and do other kind of, you know, really accessible stuff. So connecting with us, as an institute, either on our social media or getting on our newsletter list, you can, you know, be in, be, be, see what we're doing and where we want to go. Um, working with me, you can contact me by email, contact me on Facebook, you know, tell me what you're interested in and, and see what I can do to connect you, what I can do to sort of create a, a community or show you communities that where you can be effective. Uh, because again, you can be effective in your own right, modeling, just being a person who's interested in always being curious and always finding new things. But you can also then get involved with some of the older, older organizations, so to speak, who may benefit a bit from a little better pace on the change, yeah. if that makes sense. Uh, so I encourage all everyone to get there's typically middies and task forces this all involves volunteer work and that might not be everybody might not have those hours to spare you know equitably but you know that's what we need we're we're we need it's such a big change like you said from a few years ago or a decade ago when there was just a few people who got to say things and then those people had their student and they got to say the same thing and now you know, we have access to a much broader kind of spectrum of, of experiences here in this area of human humans and horses. So that's that's where I would start there. I think you had a follow up. Um, follow up question is, yeah, if, if people are, I'm, I'm going to get those resources that you mentioned um, in a few minutes. Um, so people will know that the email will know the social media and the websites and so on. But what would be your advice? for young people going into this field now because it's a, it's a much broader field than it was and they need to orient themselves and, and find out perhaps where they fit and what the opportunities are um what's your advice yeah well, i think that it's really useful to think about human animal interactions in the context also of your human interests especially if you want to again provide services where you include animals meaning you might be particularly interested in the OCD community, obsessive compulsive disorders, um, and you you are knowledgeable and you're an advocate in, with this, you know, severe mental illness and the experience of OCD. And then you learn, hey, what are the protective factors? It could be animal relationships. It could be getting treatment outdoors instead of indoors. Like you're, you, I, I encourage people to sort of there are some people whose niche is more squarely on the animal side and they're assisting with understanding the animals as part of human services. But if you're at all interested in interacting on the human side, really becoming immersed and knowledgeable about that human topic, whether it's a specific area of learning or, mm -hmm. or, or, or support services, right? Or if you're interested in what a lot of people 
you know, contact me and say horse therapy. I, I just want to do horse therapy. My question is always, do you want to be a healthcare provider? Because therapy is typically cons- thought of as, as part of, of healthcare. Are you passionate about that? Mm-hmm. Are you passionate about treatment? You know, if so, let's think about what kind of license you want to pursue and then think about how can you include interactions with horses to enhance this to really help people have an even more enhanced experience, you know, of their of their psychotherapy work and influence some of the colleagues to whom a client can't even say they've lost their dog because they're going to say, oh, your dog died, whatever. I thought your brother was ill. Yeah. And you care about 50 times more about this dog than your brother. Like we have to sort of change that kind of culture. So. And the same can go in any area. You might not be interested in healthcare. You might be interested in other services that actually suit some populations better. And then uh, be really good at that. Be really good at the context you're in and then understand how those animal interactions fit. Is Again, I'm taking just one one angle here. There's many yeah, more. It's a, good, it's a very good angle though because I think what you've touched on is that when people are coming out of the horse community wanting to go into quote unquote therapeutic riding, which is just the term a lot of people would use in a very general way without necessarily knowing what that is or quite where they would end up within the equine assisted field. I think what you've touched on is that a lot of people want to come into it from a just, well, I want to use horses. I love horses and I want to use horses to help people feel better, which is of course a laudable and good thing. But I think that often it's not thought through much more than that and then if you put yourself in say my position as an autism father well I would like in a perfect world the person who's interacting with my autistic child to have a really 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 solid background in autism I also want them to have the horse skills of course but I want them to be taking that deep and vocational interest in the condition that my son has Otherwise, there's a bit of a limit to what they can offer. And so I think your point is is actually very valid, that if you're horsey and you want to go into the equine-assisted world, you've probably got some horse skills already. And of course, we can always upskill ourselves. There'll be a, a small minority of people that come in as absolute rookies, but most people do it because they're already involved in horses. But I agree with you, it's not enough. I I think that without taking seriously the vocational uh, feel of trying to be quite specific about the population or populations that you want to work with, because of course there's interplay between them, is something that I think isn't often thought through by people when they're going into the industry. And then what happens is they can end up getting a bit lost. Um... Do you know of courses, training programs, orientation programs, that sort of thing that are being offered by some of these larger organizations that you're now involved with or other institutions that some of these people entering the industry could look to, to help themselves get oriented? Yeah, my, my advice, and of course it's going to be a little biased is to check us out as an academic institution because we have some trainings for sure, but we are also not like, we also function as a knowledge hub, Right. meaning we're not needing to sell our own stuff. We have a university structure that helps, you know, keep us also going and that affords us that kind of a perspective, right? Where I can't, you know, if I ran my own own business, I wouldn't, you know, miss an opportunity to promote it but it's it becomes a little different when you get to be in the in that this academic setting it can have some drawbacks too but but that's what i would say you know people who are uh interested in various ways that forces can be included can on them their own think what kind of human service do i want to do like we said what do i want to be really serious about really knowledge knowledgeable about really make sure i'm not missing the mark here being harmful unintentionally mm. Um, mm. and then about 
including, you know, horses there because you can include interactions with animals and you can emphasize them in just endless amounts of human, human services and human yeah. profession. So that's where I would sort of go because it depends on if people want to do adaptive writing lessons, I would send them one way. I have that credential as well. If they want to do another kind of school-based work uh, and, and really just want to get going on learning about some of the curriculum examples, I know where to send them. So, but I think the overall idea kind of capturing this, this idea that if you think about it that way, that the human service exists and you include the horse into that human service, it really helps you stay clear on, I need to be really good at both these things. Yeah. Both yeah. Them, yeah. Them both the, yeah. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. In some ways it makes it one of the most complex fields to go into because it, it, then you, you've got the whole human side mm-hmm. and the condition that you're looking to dress, but then you've got the whole horse training for that side. And then you've got the whole horse welfare side before you're even looking at the organizational ups and downs of, of running programs and so on, you know, it's, it's really generous of you to say that you can guide people and people can email you. Um, I know there are going to be some people that will want to, um, can you give us an email that we can give to people? Absolutely. I, and I will make sure I have it in writing. It's going to be at my, you know, my, should I say it now? Or should we put it? Yeah. In why don't you say it now and I'll repeat it and then I'll, I'll, I'll get it. For, we'll, we'll make sure it's there as a, as a link in the blurb. Yes. And we'll write it down. And the good thing is because I have three names. If you put all those three names, one after another in, in your internet engine, you will most likely land on me. Just make there sure aren't you many do all. There are fries out there. It's true. Yeah. No, I know it's the extra name, you know, it's sort of <laughs> probability wise adds it. So my email is my first name, N-I-N-A, and then there's a period, and then there's my middle name, E-K-H-O-L-M. And then in my email, there's a hyphen, but otherwise there is not. F-R-Y at. It, it, it runs in, yeah, Econ Fry is just one word, right? This. Uh, there's a hyphen, hyphen between uh, hyphen. Home, right? But really, in my name, there is not. <laughs> Got but it. in the address, there was the technological restraints and how 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 you can write these three names. So, yeah, first name N I N A period E K H O L M hyphen F R Y at D S in Denver U S in University dot E D U, and that's how you can find me directly. You can also find this email, like I said, by by searching for my name and D and you, and you'll see the university and you'll see my faculty page as well. So let me read this back to you. Nina, N-I-N-A dot Ekholm, E-K-H-O-L-M hyphen F-R-Y at D-U dot E-D-U. Perfect. Okay, got it. And then give us a website that people can go to, to learn more about the work at the university that you're doing there, the Institute. Um, so, yes. Um, easiest way to, is to type in IHAC. So it's an acronym for Institute for Human Animal Connection. So it's I H A C dot D as in Denver, U as in university dot E D U. So just put in ihac.du.edu and you'll find our institute, our institute's work where you learn a lot more about our research areas, a lot more about our, our events and professional development and training, and also just how we want to implement or bring to practice the knowledge that we also generate through our, through our, our research. ihac.du.edu. Institute right. for Human and Animal Connection at Denver University. And there they can also learn, access your online education stuff, um, the events you do, the streaming events that you do, and they can sort of join that community and benefit from that. Um, that if, if, if someone, this was going to be another question, if, if, if people are running programs and they want to find 
get oriented towards finding studies that back up the work that they're doing, um, which of course is always helpful when they're looking for funding. Does IHAC, can it help them with that to find some, some of the studies that will support the work, the equine assisted work? Yeah, we don't have a, a public repository, but others do. And there's actually a big one run by Fran Jurga, who, who's, you know, an equine, okay. an equine assisted studies repository where you can, you know, search yourself, so to speak. Okay. Um, because, because our systems are, you know, our university libraries and things are, 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 university specific which is one of the nations sadly of working in that system yeah but that's how i would that's how i would start the search and also knowing that when you're looking for research to support your proposals your grant applications my, my top tip is you're going to need to be creative because there's research but the research is as varied as some of the experiences Rupert and I have talked about where sometimes you walk into a, a, a training place and you're going to run a course and you go, okay, yeah. we have different thoughts about, about horses here. And interestingly enough, because the equal, you know, equine interactions or human horse interactions area is so niche sometimes, and I've been, as I mentioned, a journal editor myself, but sometimes I think that people just said, ah, you can publish that. That's fine. It sounds interesting. And we sort of lost lost the plot a little bit on on the rigor. So that would be my also my top tip that in all things we must be creative. There won't be a treasure trove of research articles that are perfect. You are still going to need to, you know, sort of work on your work on your case and not and not rely on on some perhaps me, me, medium quality stuff that's out there. But you say this. There's someone called Fran Yerga who has put together a repository of the of yes. equine assisted studies. She has a huge repository, uh, and I'm and I'm now kind of blanking on the exact name of its. It's J she's J U R G A, isn't she, Fran Yerga? Yeah, yes, with a J. Yes, and she's based up. Is she based up in Massachusetts? I seem to think. Perhaps, perhaps I just. I'll, I I'll look her up. Yeah, I talked to her just or like a couple of months ago last, but but yeah, yeah. check it out. I can't the, the actual actual name escapes me, but I, it shouldn't be too hard to find. That's right. something that she's working on, and, and that's been what a labor of love for her to put that together just to help advance I, the field. I don't know. We'll have to investigate more. I only know that she's in touch with me regularly to check in about publications and things like that. So she's really you know, invested in, in sort of bringing things together in an accessible place is, is my experience, but we, we have to investigate further. She might be an interesting guest too. So no, she might well, and actually I'm, I'm, I'm looking her up now. Um, so if, if, if listeners want to type in her name, Fran Yerga, J-U-R-G-A, you'll see that she pops up, that she's a researcher. She also other types of veterinary equine science, hoof care, um, equine podiatry, equestrian sport, um, and veterinary medicine. So it's, it's, she's quite broad. Um, and, uh, yeah, I can see the resources just, so if you just, just typing in a, her name gets one too. to, to, I think she might actually be in Michigan. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's a good tip. Um, well, listen, it's been, it's been great to reconnect with you. It always is. And I'm just so impressed with how you've just helped to advance the field. And one thing which I've also really appreciated, I think, um, you know, when I first got involved in things at equine assisted, I didn't do it by choice. As you know, I did it because my son had this reaction to the horse and so I followed it and off we went. But of course I found out very quickly how factional and sometimes toxic the world of equine assisted stuff was sadly. And it came from a scarcity mentality of, of people being worried. I think that there was a limited number of resources out there. So anything new was a threat. Um, 
And I think that it's not quite as bad as that anymore. And I think um, that's been, I think you've been hugely influential in that, actually, Nina. Um, I think your Scandinavian sense of justice and fairness, sorry, Nordic, really, I should say, um, <laughs> has made a real contribution I've, I've i've watched you over the years bringing people together bringing people together bringing the organizations together making sure everybody has a profile um and i think you've actually i think it's actually borne fruit um i think that you've helped to make the culture itself more empathetic which was very necessary because we're supposed to be hiding empathetic services so if we're not leading with that ourselves then there's a bit of a limit to the what we can offer to, to a client who needs it um but really you, you've been very instrumental in that ever since the prescott days so you know please please keep doing it and anything we can do to support you must let us know because it's it goes so beyond individual methodologies it's one big field. Um, and I see it much more almost like a, a university with a bunch of different faculties, but they're all related. They're all related. And it, if we want health authorities and governments and so forth to take us to the next level, then we also have to start behaving l like grown-ups, at least in public. So. <laughs> I think you've been an inspiration that way, and you've 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 brought out the best in people to to sort of bring their higher self to the field. So thank you for that. Well, thank you. That was a that was a lovely, uplifting thing, and that's what I've always felt from you too. So I I, I love the the symbio symbiosis here. Um, and I so appreciate being a guest on this, on this podcast, you know, I, I just, I mean, our conversations are always great, but to be able to be part of the podcast community as well and to everybody listening, yeah, uh, so lovely. So thank you. And anytime you've got, you know, uh, and the Institute has something new coming up, let us know and we can broadcast it, let people know, big it up. Wonderful. Yeah. Well, well, I know that you've you've probably run over the time that you needed to give because fair a full disclosure, listeners, I was a bit late. And so Nina's actually been very generous to let us go as long as I know she needs to run off to another meeting. So thank you. Uh, and let's catch up soon and hopefully we get to do this again. Of course, we, we can only hope. No, I would love to. So thank you again for having me, for letting me talk about my human horse interaction stuff. And again, for being part of this with all your listeners. Thank you. Okay. See you soon. Thank you for joining us. We hope you enjoyed today's podcast. Join our website, newtrailslearning.com to check out our online courses and live workshops in Horseboy Method, Movement Method, and Athena. These evidence-based programs have helped children, veterans, and people dealing with trauma around the world. We also offer a horse training program and self-care program for riders on longridehome.com. These include easy-to-do online courses and tutorials that bring you and your horse joy. For an overview of all shows and programs, go to rupertisaacson.com. See you on the next show. And please remember to press subscribe and share.